Hey, Walter Sorrels back again with more tips for the knife maker. Today, this stuff, steel. Okay, so when you first start out in knife making, there are all these choices of different kinds of steel. And if you get on the forums, you're going to hear all these people t saying this kind of steel is so great and this steel is crap. And if you use this, you're an idiot and blah, blah, blah. It can be kind of bewildering. So what I'm going to try and do in this video is to just say, okay, here are the various steels that are out there. Um, and looking at the kind of knives that you want to make, here are the steels that I'd recommend for you. So... The truth is that steel is not the single most important thing that you have to choose. Your craft as a knife maker, how well you heat treat the steel, how well you shape it, the geometry, all that stuff's more important than the choice of steel. But that said, there are steels that are more appropriate for certain uses and less appropriate. So that's what I'm going to do uh, today is go over those and hopefully by the end of this, if you're just getting started, you'll have some good recommendations of some steels that you'll want to use. The first general distinction I'm going to make here is between knife makers who forge their blades and knife makers who work by stock removal. Basically, forging means you heat it up, you beat it into shape with a hammer, Stock removal, you're grinding it using a belt grinder, a file, uh, you know, even a, a, an angle grinder, but you're starting with a bar of steel and you're just taking steel off. Those two kinds of knife making are quite different. And as a general rule, the people who do forging use very different steels from those who do um, stock removal. So let's start with simple carbon steels. Most of the time, people who forge are going to use fairly simple steels. So let's back up a little bit and talk about just what steel is. Steel is basically iron plus carbon plus various other alloying elements. But if you don't have iron and carbon, you don't have steel. As you change different alloying elements, you change the working qualities of the steel. And this is why steel has historically been so useful. You can use it for I-beams, you can use it for edge tools, you can use it for uh, concrete reinforcement, just innumerable different kinds of things. And every different application is gonna have a very different kind of steel. So, guys who forge want to heat treat, that is, harden the steel um, themselves by heating it up and quenching it in oil or water or whatever and that drives their choice of steel so basically forging guys are going to use what are known as in the United States parlance anyway 10 series or 10x series steels these are simple carbon steels that are composed of iron usually around 99 percent iron uh, carbon, which is going to run from between five, uh, five tenths of a percent or 0.5 percent carbon and around one percent carbon. This puts it in a range where you can reasonably heat treat it, that is, harden the steel. If it's below mm, 0.4 percent, 0.45 percent, somewhere in that range, you just can't uh, cool it quickly enough to cause it to harden. Once you get much over 1%, typically, you know, this is an oversimplification, but as a general rule, it starts to get too brittle, and eventually it becomes cast iron. So somewhere in that range is what you want. So the way that uh, the designation of carbon steels works is 10 indicates the, um, the, the type of steel, which is a simple high carbon steel or simple carbon steel, and then the number that comes after that, like it's 1050, 1060, 1070, whatever. If it's 50, that's 0.5% carbon. If it's 60, 0.6% carbon. If it's 1070, that's 0.7% carbon. In terms of recommendations for guys who are just getting started forging, the most typical kinds of steels that you'll find out there would be 1050, uh, 1065 maybe, 
1075, 1080, sometimes they call them 1075, slash 1080, but that's kind of a general designation. And then 1095 is a very common steel. All those steels will work for you. If you can find a source for those steels, all of those are reasonable choices for a beginning uh, smith. Um, personally, I would probably start with 1095 because it's very easy to find and uh, you can oil harden it or water harden it. All right, so let's move to stock removal. As a general rule, I would say stock removal guys are gonna use what are generally classified as stainless steels. So I said earlier that steel is basically composed of iron and carbon. There are also a number of other alloying elements like uh, manganese, which is used in virtually all commercially available steels, uh, and chromium. So chromium is what makes stainless steel stainless. Now, if you take a, a heat-treated stainless steel knife and you throw it in a lake, at a certain point, it's probably going to oxidize a little bit. But basically speaking, it's not going to rust. Whereas if you take a simple carbon steel, 1050, 1075, 1095, and you throw it in the lake, uh, you dig it up you know, a couple weeks later, and it's going to look like it just came out of a Viking burial mound. It's just going to be caked with rust, and um, it's going to look awful. So, um, there are also a number of other implications of having chromium in steel. Basically, if you have more than about 14% chromium in steel, it's, it's not going to rust significantly. Um, and that's, you know, sort of the threshold that they would consider to be uh, stainless steel, 12-14%, somewhere in there. Um, Chromium also has some very important effects on the heat treating cap uh, or, or qualities of steel, and we're not going to get into those here, but typically if you're using stainless steel, when you first get started, you're going to ship that off and let somebody else handle it. Okay, so what kind of stainless steels are out there? Some of the typical names would be 440C, uh, ATS-34, um, and uh, you know there are a whole host of people often call them super steels, uh, CPM 30, S30V, and, and various other things like that. Um, my recommendation is going to be simple. Start out with 440C. That is kind of the classic knife maker steel. You can make a super knife with 440C, um, and uh, it's, it's easier to find people who know how to heat treat it well. Uh, and this is the single most important benefit of 440C over some of the super steels. It's a lot cheaper. I've got um, Admiral Steel. They're a big uh, supplier of steels to blade makers. Uh, latest price list here. <clears throat> so for a piece of, uh, let's see, what do we got here? 1 8 by 1 by 72 inch uh, 440C. That's going to cost you $35.40. If you buy CPM S30V, that same piece is going to cost you $85.55. Now, I think most people, when they get started, they think, oh, I want the best deal. I want this and that. I'm going to make this super knife. You know, I'm going to make the greatest knife ever made. Realistically, you're just not going to. Your first knife is going to suck. So, no offense, it's just true. So why spend a whole bunch of money on uh, a steel that, you know, is going to result in a knife that's not going to be that good anyway? So start with something that a lot of people understand that's fairly, uh, you know, uh, widely heat treated and that's not super duper expensive. That's why I would recommend 440C. Once you kind of start to get good, moving up to... Um, 154 cm or uh, ATS 34 those are good choices classic uh, steels that have been used by some of the best knife makers over the years uh, again still a little cheaper than some of these super steels like uh, s30v um, once you really get good 
start jumping into those super steels and see what you know see how you like them but they're much harder they've got a lot of vanadium and that's another one of the uh, alloying elements in there it forms very hard carbides and they're a little harder to grind uh, they're just harder to work with so I wouldn't start with those okay so now I've kind of broken this down uh, into stainless steels and high carbon steels but there are a bunch of steels that sort of fit somewhere in the middle uh, a lot of these are typically referred to as tool steels but there's some other ones I'm going to mention that uh, kind of go into other categories um, so let me talk about tool steels first so the main ones that you'll see are W1, um, A2, D2, and O1. Uh, so let me kind of break those down um, individually. The simplest of those is W1. W1 is actually very, you know, chemically pretty similar to uh, 1095. The difference is that W1 uh, is has to be by the specifications held to slightly tighter tolerances in, in terms of the carbon uh, percentage and things like that than uh, 1095 but basically it's roughly 1% carbon uh, and 99% iron that's basically what you're getting with W1 um, it's a water hardening steel um, also when you use it in say knife sized pieces you can use it as um, uh, you can you can usually oil harden it um, so let's see going down the list um, O1 is pretty similar to that but it has a lot more manganese now I haven't talked too much about manganese in this uh, in this video manganese is a very very important alloying element that has a strong effect on the heat treating characteristics of steel what it does in uh, in the case of uh, O1 is by having a much higher um, manganese uh, proportion than say the simple carbon steels the 10 series steels um, it's basically easier to heat treat it, you can oil harden it and it'll through harden much easier meaning that it'll harden all the way through the entire section of steel um, more so than simple carbon steels um, I think O1 is a great kind of starter steel. So if you're doing stock removal and you want to make knives that you can heat treat yourself using reasonably unsophisticated equipment, I think O1 is a great place to start. Um, let's see, A2 and D2, um, pretty sim well, I was somewhat similar steels. A2 has significantly less chromium, roughly around 5% chromium. Uh, D2, if I recall correctly, is around 14% chromium, 12% chromium, something like that. It's not quite a stainless steel, um, but it's what you would call stain resistant. Uh, it's terrific steel, but I wouldn't uh, think of using it if you're uh, a relative novice um, steel, uh, a relative novice knife maker. So. Um, the basic thing about um, uh, tool room steels that you need to be aware of is that they typically are sold in uh, precision ground sizes, meaning that uh, it's been ground to very tight tolerances. And that grinding uh, and that precision is something you have to pay for. Um, so, you know, to me, there's no compelling reason when you're first getting started to use uh, those precision ground uh, tool room type steels because it, they, they just cost a lot more than um, simple carbon steels. But they're fairly easy to get hold of. And like I say, O1 is a, is a steel that you can source in a lot of different places. You know, in the grand scheme of things, not a bad place to start. So if you have a source for O1, um, you know, it, it's, it's a steel that is, is actually pretty kind of user friendly and, and uh, I, I wouldn't hesitate to recommend it for relative novice uh, uh, smiths or, or uh, stock removal guys. So two more steels that you'll hear a fair amount about in magazines and things like that, um, 5160 and um, 52100. So 52100 is, has been popularized by Ed Fowler and some other, you know, kind of American Bladesmith Society type guys. 
has a lot of interesting potential, but it's not a beginner's steel. So despite the fact that you'll read about Ed Fowler using it and so on and so forth, I would stay away from it uh, until you've gained a fair amount of uh, knowledge and experience as a knife maker. Uh, okay, one more steel that uh, you'll see not infrequently is uh, 5160. Again, it's reasonably complicated uh, alloy, it has some chromium in it, some molybdenum, and, um, you know, personally, I just don't see it as a beginner steel. It's not that hard to heat treat initially, and you can do some cool things with it. Uh, it's very tough steel, but again, just, you know, it's not a beginner steel in my, in my view. So uh, I, I would put that one aside. Okay, so let me uh, deal with one other issue, and that's what they call mystery steel. Basically, you know, hey, my uncle Leroy has got an old school bus from the 30s rusting in his backyard. I could get a leaf spring off of that, and I, I've been told that would be great. Or, you know, I found this saw blade out in the... Yeah, okay, it's cheap because it's free. But does that mean that it's going to be a good steel for you to learn on? I say no. It's better, in my view anyway, not to use mystery steel because if you figure out how to use that mystery steel and then you're done with it you know you can't repeat what you what you learned with it i prefer to you know buy a steel that has a known chemistry the the steel supplier can send you um you know a data sheet telling you exactly what the alloying elements are and what the proportions are and then you can start to repeat your 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 uh, processes mystery steel you just never know you might get something good but I, I think most people find that when they mess around with steel that they don't know the composition of it just leads to heartbreak because they spend a whole bunch of time and they just never have repeatable results and they never really know why things go wrong or or uh, go well let me let me just kind of summarize everything that I've said here basically if you're uh, a forging guy, if you're a smith, start with simple carbon steels. Personally, I would say right out of the right out of the box, go with uh, 1075, 1080, 1095. Those are reasonably easy to find and reasonably cheap. If you're going to go with stock removal, my recommendation would be to start with uh, 440C. It's a good solid steel, long history, and um, you know there are a lot of people who know how to heat treat it um, and it's a lot cheaper than some of the other alternatives out there uh, one you know third steel that I think is worth looking at is 01 uh, especially if you want to do uh, if you want to try doing your own heat treating and you're doing stock removal stuff you can buy uh, 01 in you know reasonable sizes it's gonna be a little more expensive than say carbon steels uh, but the heat treating is, is quite simple, um, and so it's a satisfactory place to, to get started on stock removal. So, last thing, where do you buy all these things? Uh, I'm going to do a, another video about that, um, hopefully in a few weeks, but uh, I'll get around to it eventually. Um, you know, it depends on where you live in the world, uh, but there are some good places you can buy stuff in the United States. Um, and uh, you know Google's your friend start there if you're looking for steel right this minute um, you know Google it and you can find some good places uh, to buy it we'll talk more about buying steel in another video thanks for watching hope you enjoyed it